to have all of you here. 2020, it's here. It's amazing. I don't have a jet pack yet, but maybe next year. Keep hoping for those publicly purchasable jet packs that we, are, we were promised in the 1980s. Um, I read too much science fiction, I guess. Uh, it's great to have you here this morning. If you are a guest with us today, my name's Kevin. I serve as the lead pastor here at Greenbelt. Now, something really weird happened to me over the Christmas holidays. And to be honest, I'm still kind of processing this and trying to come to grips with what happened to me over the Christmas holidays. Um, a couple of years ago, you've noticed that I started wearing reading glasses. This was just something, you know, I kind of noticed that when I get up here, my Bible is a little blurry. My computer screen is a little blurry. So I put this on and the text just comes alive. It's me. That's the Bible text comes alive. You get it? That's a Christian joke for the Christians in the room, okay? The text just comes alive with it. The computer screen comes alive. So it's just a little thing that, you know, just to help out a bit. Something weird happened over the Christmas holidays. Everything became blurry. You're blurry. Is it a haze in here or is it just me? Like, you're blurry. My kids are blurry. My, my, my home is blurry. My office is blurry. Everything is kind of blurry. And it's kind of this weird thing. It's like, hmm, what's going on? And so I Google it. Am I dying? Do I have brain cancer? You know, you know it's not that I'm from a long line of overreactors in my family, but you know, you just want to double check these things. Make sure you don't have brain cancer, you know, when weird things start happening. Maybe I didn't get enough sleep. Maybe I'm not showering well enough and getting the sleep out of my eyes. What's going on? And I go on Google and I kind of say, oh, for people 40, to 49, 50, between 40, 60 years old, welcome to the new normal. <laughs> that your eyes are old, and you're old, and everything that you see is now blurry. Now, I am going to deal with this eventually, <laughs> okay? like we all do, right? We all call our doctors eventually. But as I was wrestling with this over the Christmas holidays, and, and it's the little things that you kind of realize this is starting to impact. One of the things I like to do as a hobby is I, I like to paint little tiny soldiers. The soldiers are about that big. The paint brushes have about four little hairs on the tip of the paintbrush, and you sit there and you paint them. Stupid hobby. I don't, I don't do that hobby anymore. So if anyone would like to buy a bunch of little miniature Star Wars soldiers, come and see me after the service because I can't see them anymore. Okay? I started playing guitar. I picked up a guitar a couple of years ago, and it's just been one of these things I wanted to do. And so I'm sitting down, I'm playing the guitar, and, and I'm, I got this app. It's like, go on the, the D string. The D string is the third or fourth string. I don't remember. It's one of the strings in the middle. And I'm like, I can't find it. So I throw the guitar out the window. No, I didn't do that. But you see, like suddenly when life becomes blurry, suddenly we get distracted. We don't hit the right notes, we don't paint in the right area, we kind of waste our time on the wrong thing. And as I was reflecting on this, sometimes church can be a little bit like that as well. When the church loses her vision, when the vision of the church becomes blurry, we can waste a lot of time doing things that don't matter playing the wrong note, painting outside the lines, not reading the text properly. All these different things can happen when the vision of the church becomes blurry. So what I want to do over the next three weeks is kind of just help us readjust our vision. I thought I was incredibly clever coming up with the sermon series titled 2020 Vision. And then I found out every single pastor in the world is preaching a sermon today called 2020 Vision. There is nothing new under the sun. There is no creativity left on the planet, or at least not in my office, okay? But this is this series I want us to do so that we can work on our eyes together as a church family. How are we doing? Are we... Is our vision becoming a little blurry? Because as, just like as people get older and the vision becomes blurry, what we're actually seeing in Canada today is as churches get older, the vision of the church becomes blurry. 
And we see, why are we seeing so many churches in our day closing? Some churches are growing and thriving and reaching people and having this incredible influence in their communities. And it's exciting. But yet there's these other churches are closing their doors, are shutting down their ministry, have become distracted by the things that aren't the priority of the church. So what we're going to do for the next three weeks is we're going to look at our vision. Next week, we're going to talk about the importance of connecting. We're going to talk about how it's incredibly important for you, for I, as a follower of Jesus, to connect with God and what that means. And also we're going to look at at the importance of connecting with one another. Even the most extreme introvert needs one or two people to connect with. We weren't meant to do this life alone. So next week, we're going to talk about the importance of connecting. The week after that, we're going to talk about the importance of becoming more like Jesus. You see, every single Christian is called to become more Christ-like. Now, that doesn't mean we're all clones and we're all carbon copies of one another and we all look the same, sound the same, act the same, behave the same, but we are all growing in our Christ-likeness. And we're going to see how that is incredibly important for you as a, and me as a follower of Jesus. But today what I want to do is I want to start with the big why. Why is it important for you to connect with God? Why? Why is it important for you to connect with other people? Why? Why is it important for you to become more like Jesus? That's what we need to figure out. Because we can think what we're doing is helping people connect with God. We can think what we're doing is helping people connect with one another. We can think what we're doing is helping people become more like Jesus. But the Bible shows us that you will see evidence of that. So we're going to start with the answer. Why do we do this? Why do we do this church thing? And the way we're going to do this, we're going to look at two very familiar stories from the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament. I strongly urge you during this series, I urge you every Sunday, but particularly in this series, bring a Bible. Because I'm going to show you something and I don't want you to sit there and go, well, that's fine. That's Kevin's interpretation of it. I want you to see this for yourself. You see, this is what happens when we go through Bible stories and texts in the Bible that are so familiar, it becomes blurry. How many of you have ever read a text and you know you've read this a thousand times and you read it and you're like, I've never seen that before. Who's, who's done that? Okay, it's not because the evil publishers of the NIV changed and added verses to your Bible. Okay, there isn't some secret organization that's changing the Bible on you without your knowledge. It's because sometimes we become so familiar with these stories that we miss the point of them. So what we're all going to do is we're going to put on our glasses. Whoa, you got even more blurry. Okay, blur, more blurry, blurrier, whatever. English isn't my first language. It is, but anyways. And what we're going to do is we're going to look here in Luke chapter 19. I want you to see this. Open it up on your Bible app. If you don't have a Bible, if you don't own a Bible, there's one in the chair in front of you. That is our gift to you today. You can keep that Bible as a gift. If you're using the Bible that's in front of you, you turn to page 500 and, uh, sorry, 852. 852 is where I want you to see this because I have preached before a sermon on the first part and then I've preached a sermon on the second part. But what we have to do today is preach a sermon on both parts stuck together because if you don't see the text together, we may have blurry vision and miss the point of what Luke is trying to tell us here. So let's start in Luke chapter 19 
and we're going to answer the big why. Why we do this. What is the vision of the church? It starts in chapter 19, verse 1. Talking about Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. And so he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And so he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. Now all the people saw this and they began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. You see, this is a very, very, very familiar story. If you have grown up in church, if you were a child in church, you learned this story in Sunday school. And not only did you learn the story, you put it to a song. You remember the song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. I didn't go to Sunday school as a kid. I was a heathen. I was out in the streets. But, you know, uh, I, I think that's how the song goes. Did I get it right? Yeah. yeah. You didn't join in, so I assumed I got it wrong. <laughs> I was hoping for a little bit more audience participation on the song, right? But we do this. We take these stories. They're so familiar. We sing these cute little songs. And you've got a picture of this story in your mind because of the song. You do. And that picture probably looks like a short little fat guy in a robe that's perfectly white and clean. And he's got this nice fluffy beard. And there's this little short fat dude climbing up a tree. And he's got this big smile on his face. And then blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus is coming by. <laughs> he was Middle Eastern. Why do we keep making him blonde with blue eyes? Okay, he probably looked Jewish. <laughs> Anyways, that's another sermon for another day. And he's up in this tree, and Jesus is like, Zacchaeus, I want to party with you. I want to go to your house. And Zacchaeus jumps out of the tree, and he's all happy, and there's a party. And Jesus says these famous words, today salvation has come to this house. Today, salvation has come to this house. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Very familiar. Now, if you're new to the Bible, you have to understand whenever we study the Bible, we can't just look at the text. You have to understand the context that it was originally written in. We believe, I believe that the Word of God, the Bible is timeless. It speaks to every culture in every point in human history. But it was written for a specific culture in a specific place for a specific purpose. And sometimes when you spend a little bit of time to learn that, it opens up our eyes, gives us a little clearer vision of what God is actually trying to say to the culture today on this. This text was written by a man named Luke. We know from different studies and research that Luke was a medical doctor. He was a well-educated, smart guy. Luke traveled with the apostle Paul on Paul's missionary journeys around the world, planting churches, raising up elders, raising up pastors. Luke was there. We also know that Luke wasn't Jewish. He was a Gentile from the city of Antioch. And if you study what was going on in the city of Antioch, that was where there was like this explosion of the Christian faith, 
where churches were being planted, leaders were being developed. God was moving in a mighty way in Antioch. And Luke was from there. But what we also see from his writings is Luke had a very good, solid understanding of the Jewish scriptures. Because he uses those to connect the people who are reading his letter to the history of the Jewish people. But also because he's a Gentile, he writes in such a way that connects with the heart of non-Jewish people as well. So he manages, because he's a bright guy, he's a smart guy, he's an educated guy, he manages to write this letter in such a way that both the Jewish religious person and the non-religious Gentile can understand it. And he writes it with a very specific purpose. See, sometimes we forget that. We go, wow, we got this text, you know, for my glory and, so, and for whatever reason, and we come up with our own reasons why we've got these texts. What's amazing for me is when the Bible actually tells you why it's written. And Luke does that for us. He wrote this letter, and he wrote another letter called the book of Acts with a very specific purpose. And both those letters are best to be read together and studied together because this is why Luke wrote them. He wrote them to this guy, sorry, to a guy named Theophilus. We don't know who that person is, but he wrote it to that person. And based on how it's done and with church history, but the assumption was it wasn't just for this person, but was also for it to be read among other people. But the purpose was found in, is found in Luke 1, chapter, uh, sorry, chapter 1, verse 4, where it says, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. The purpose of, the, of Luke's gospel, the purpose of the book of Acts is so that you can take what you have heard about Jesus and learned about Jesus and you can know for certainty that the things that you have been told are valid because it's coming from an educated guy, from a guy who's done his research, from a guy who was there seeing what Paul and the other apostles were doing a guy who was putting together all the witness accounts. See, think of it like this. See, we live in a day and an age today where we have so much information available to us. How many of you have got one of these? Hold it proudly. Hold that wonderful piece of technology with pride. We all have one of these. And then you get these articles about somebody, about someone in government, someone in leadership, a pastor, a neighbor, and reality is you don't know if it's from someone credible or if it's written by someone who's sitting in their basement who's just trying to get you to click on it so that they can make three cents every time you click on it. And we have no way of validating it. But our culture today has gone absolutely crazy believing anything. <laughs> because it's on the internet, it must be trustworthy. <laughs> Because Google said it came up, it was the number three Google search. It must be true. <laughs> right? It just means a lot of people clicked it. <laughs> That's how these algorithms work, right? But imagine now in Jesus' day, people hearing about Jesus, religious people hearing about Jesus, non-religious people hearing about Jesus. They're hearing a whole lot of stuff. And Luke's saying, no, I'm writing this stuff down so that you can know for certainty the things that the apostles taught you is true. That's the purpose. Whether they're Jew or Gentile, they can know for certainty that Jesus is who they are claiming him to be. Religious people, non-religious people, the rich, the poor. This is why we have this text. And we write as theologians and as scholars and as Bible people, we write books and books and books on what is the purpose of the church and what is the purpose of Jesus's mission. If you want to borrow some of these books, they're great to help you fall asleep at night. Yeah. <laughs> they are good and they're well worth reading, but oh my goodness, we add a whole lot of pages to the one sentence mission of Jesus. Jesus' mission for the church is one sentence long. For the Son of Man came to seek 
and save the lost. That's the point. That's it. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Now, this familiar story of Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector. The tax collectors back in Jesus' day worked for the Roman government. Rome came in, they occupied Israel, they were taking over the whole known world. They would place governors, they would place officials to kind of control the people. They would still give them some freedom because you didn't want these full revolts. You'd let them worship in their temple and let them have their king and their little local government. But really they were under this yoke of Rome. And then Rome needed taxes. And they would assign people from each region that they took over to be the tax collector. And these tax collectors were despised as traitors to their own people. And most tax collectors became very wealthy because they could knock on your door and say, you owe Rome $500. But in reality, on the ledger, you only owed 100 <laughs> And they could keep the 400 so people despise them. Whenever the Bible talks about tax collectors, they're the worst of sinners. Now Zacchaeus, he's the chief tax collector. In other words, he supervises tax collectors. So the $400 that that tax collector makes, he gives some of that money to Zacchaeus. It's kind of like this pyramid thing where Zacchaeus is skimming off the top of all the other tax collectors. It's a great business to make a lot of money because if the people don't pay it, Roman guards show up in the middle of the night and you disappear. <laughs> Thankfully, our government doesn't work that way <laughs> when you don't pay your taxes, right? So it's this whole system that's going on. This is who Zacchaeus is. And then what's fascinating here is verse 7. When it says in verse 7, all the people saw this. See, the Greek word here for all the people means all the people. <laughs> and all the people, you have to study, who are all the people who are following Jesus around at this time? All the people include the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law and the elders. It includes the disciples and the followers of Jesus could be in the hundreds or in the thousands by this point. It includes the skeptics, the sick, the demon-possessed, those who are anxious for a touch from Jesus to be healed. It also includes his enemies. All in this mixed mash of all the people. See, and then Luke does something very, very fascinating here by tying in these, this story to the next story. See, if I were to just stop and we just unpack this, we sit there and go, oh yeah, I agree that the mission of Jesus is to seek and save the lost, but then I'm just going to go about my life. It's easy to preach Jesus came to seek and save the lost. That's an easy thing to say, but Jesus then dives deeper into it. Look at how Luke continues. He talks about a parable, and this parable is to illustrate the point that he just made. Verse 11 says, while they were listening to this, while they, who are the they? The they is the, all the people from verse 7. While they heard this, while they heard what was going on. And who are the people in verse 7? It's, again, all the people we said, but what are they doing? They're doing something called muttering. And muttering means... Can you believe that person? Can you believe that person wore that to church? Can you believe that person acts like this? Can you believe that person believed that? Can you believe that they did this? Nah, 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 nah. Okay, that's my Kevin paraphrase of what muttering means. Here's the thing about all people. In every single, every single, every single human being is a strand of sin that will cause you to mutter all of us. I have never met a human being that is exempt from muttering. I am a mutterer. 
You don't believe me? Follow me on social media and ask me about the rise of Skywalker. <laughs> I go down many rabbit trails in conversations about the rise of Skywalker. And I'm going to save that for July in our At The Movies series. <laughs> okay? You have in you the sin of muttering. I in me have the sin of muttering. It's there in every single human being. And we justify it and we make up religious rules around it. And Jesus speaks directly to it in this parable. While they, they are the, all the people who are muttering that Jesus would hang out with sinners. This is why he goes into this story. He says, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10, ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we do not want this man to become king. And he was made king, however, and he returned home. And then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. And the first one came and said, Sir, your menace has earned ten more. Well done, good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your menace has earned five more. And the master answered, You take charge of five cities. And then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it and laid it away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take what you did not put, sorry, you take out what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. And his master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then did you not put my money on deposit? So when I came back, I could have collected it with interest. And then he said to those standing by, who are those standing by? The they, you know, it's all tying in here. And he said, take this mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10. And he said, sir, he already has 10. And then he replied, I tell you that everyone who has more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here. <laughs> and kill them in front of me. See, this is kind of a radically different feel to the Zacchaeus story, isn't it? I kind of wonder when the guy was writing the Zacchaeus song for kids, and they were putting together the kids' curriculum at that church or in that denomination, wherever that song was written, and they're reading Luke chapter 19, and they come up with this great song for the children, and then they keep reading. And they try to come up with a song for this one. I didn't find it. I tried to find if there's a kid's cute little kid Sunday school song for the second part of Luke chapter 19. There isn't. They probably skipped over it. Why? Because this is hard. But you can't read this parable without the story of Zacchaeus. And you can't read this parable without understanding what's going on. Jesus is talking to they, the them, the religious, the non-religious, the Jew, the Gentile, the rich, the poor, the enemies, the followers. He's speaking to this crowd. And he says this in this parable, which is fascinating, where he says in verse 14, but his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be king. This is a poke at the them. <laughs> this is the people have been waiting for a Messiah. They've been waiting for someone to come to establish the kingdom of God, to overthrow the Roman Empire, to give them their glory back in the world. And now here's this Jesus who's healing the sick, who's raising the dead, who's casting out demons. He's making lame people walk. He's making the deaf hear, the blind see. He's doing all of these things that the prophets of old said the Messiah would do, but he's not doing it in a way they like it. He's healing on the Sabbath. We don't like it. He's making the religious people, the religious leaders look like fools. We don't like this. We don't want him to be king. 
What's fascinating, when you actually then continue in reading Luke, what is the next story in Luke's gospel? Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a donkey as king. What is Jesus doing here? This parable is poking at the people who mutter, me. (laughs) Poking is a big reminder. And he continues in here in this parable. He's talking about the mina. What's a mina? It's a currency. It's about three months wages for the average worker. Here at Greenbelt, we are the average worker. (laughs) Think of your paycheck for three months. (laughs) Think about how much money that is. Think about if you didn't have it. If you were to miss out on three months of pay, what would happen with your mortgage? What would happen with your bills? What would happen with your commitment? What would happen with your groceries? Yeah. This represents your life. Three months of pay, you can't live without it. It's your whole life. The parable is asking these people, what are you doing with your life? Because then it goes in, the final part of the parable is it talks about this servant who says, I know you're a hard master. But what's fascinating about the text is the text doesn't say he's a hard master. The person thinks he is. See, the person is going, well, you just want my money. You just want, my glo- you just want the glory that should be mine. Like the work that I do, the hard work that I do, you just want to receive the glory for my life. You just want to receive the glory for the hard work I do, for the money I put in. You're, a, you're no good. I don't want you to receive the glory that I want. And then the king says, well, I'm going to judge you the way you think I am, not the way I actually am. You think I'm harsh? I'll judge you harshly. Right? So Jesus is making this incredible parallel to the mission For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. If we want to have clear vision as a church, as individuals this year, this is studying these two stories together gives us a very different big idea than when if I would have done two different sermons. (laughs) The big idea of Zacchaeus would have been one, the big idea of this parable would have been another, but studying these two things together, the big idea that I want you to write down is this. Hearing well done from God is directly related to seek and save the lost. When you and I stand before the throne of God, when Jesus returns to judge the living and the dead, the words well done, according to Luke, this is why I want you to see this for yourself. This is not Kevin's opinion. This is where Luke clearly goes in the text. You want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? It's not going to be how many Christians did you take from other churches and bring to your church. It's not going to be just simply how well was your marriage or how well did you raise your kids or how comfortable was your life? Did you get all of these blessings and live a nice, cushy, comfortable Canadian life and then die? No. Hearing well done, according to Luke, is directly connected to the mission of seeking and saving the lost. That's why we need to have clearer vision. We need a vision from God. If this is the vision, if this is the mission, if I want our church at the end of our existence to hear, well done, then we've got to be a church that puts the priority on seeking and saving the lost. Why do you connect with God? Why do you connect with other people? So you can be part of seeking and saving the lost. Why do you become more like Jesus? Why do you get victory over sin in your life? Why do we want you to grow spiritually? So you can seek and save the lost. (laughs) That's the why, (laughs) right? 
And what's fascinating when we seek God and we ask for clear vision on this, what's fascinating about the church world today is we're in our church building doing our church thing. And I've been, in September, it'll be 10 years that I've been here. In 10 years, our culture has radically changed. But we still pretty much look exactly the same as we do 10 years ago. I mean, we changed the stage, we changed the lights a little bit, you know, some staff has come and gone, but fundamentally we're still doing things, you know, we change and tweak and, and strengthen and grow, but we looked at, uh, the heart is very similar still, while culture radically changes. And it's not that we accommodate culture, but we have to understand culture if we want to be a church on mission, seeking and saving the lost. Like a couple of examples, I did a lot of research on this and I'm really privileged to have different leaders that I get to learn from. Uh, but just quickly, a couple of the ways that the world and the culture has changed. For one, um, guilt doesn't work anymore. If you're a parent or you're a grandparent and the way that you have gotten your kids to come to church is by guilting them, <laughs> some of you laughed, <laughs> some of you experienced that maybe, you know? We live in a culture today where that's, it doesn't work. Guilt and shame to do something, because why would we respond to that? Because in no other area of life do we tell people guilt and shame <laughs> works. So it's very, very, very different on how people respond. People nowadays leave their house less. You see, we actually live in a culture today where for a lot of us, we have the, the beauty of being able to work anywhere. As long as you have an internet connection, a lot of people can do their job from home, from a cafe, from McDonald's, from a parking lot. Right? We don't have to go to work. Work just comes to us. I've actually been talking to some young people who um, they don't even go shopping anymore. They don't go to a store. Everything comes to them. 100% of their Christmas presents were ordered online, and that's increasing exponentially. We even see it now. They get their groceries, order them online, and, and deliver them. Now, I'm, I, I just can't go there. I, I, I can do the books thing and the present thing, but I still need to see my food <laughs> before it shows up. But people younger than me, pff, order it. We live in a culture today where we buy pre-cut Apples. <laughs> Think about that. Pre-cut apples. And we pay $7 a bag. <laughs> cut your own apple. I don't want to. I'd rather have it cut for me. Pre-washed salad. Who, who still washes their pre-washed salad? I do. I don't trust it. I'm washing that sucker. <laughs> okay, but... Culture has radically changed. We have, and so much of our church is built around you come to us. If we just do a better program, a better Sunday, a better kids ministry, a better youth ministry, a better this, a better this, then people will come. People aren't even going to the grocery store anymore. And they don't feel guilt or shame or obligation to come to a church. So we can build and build and build and build and nobody knows. <laughs> It's changed. It's different. The other thing, the other way that our church, the culture has really changed is in the last 10 years, we have become incredibly polarized. Where we no longer have the capability of disagreeing with people in every area of life. And, I, and, and man, and I see this on social media. You want to see how polarized it is? Just follow me on social media and join some of my Star Wars groups on Twitter. My goodness. Put online, I didn't like the rise of Skywalker. Submit. You're a sexist racist. <laughs> what? It's like, well, you're obviously a misogynist and you hate women if you don't like the rise of Skywalker. <laughs> what? <laughs> I actually well, have a high, very high regard for women. I was raised in a single home by a single mom. I have a huge regard and a huge respect for women. But I didn't like Ray. It's a badly written, horrible written character. Anyway, I'm not going to go down that rabbit trail because <laughs> I'll start muttering, <laughs> okay? We can't even have a conversation anymore culturally. 
politics, business, religion. And again, we showed these earlier. When I went to Lebanon and I'm seeing refugees, they all had one of these. They didn't have a home, but they had one of these. When I went to Peru and met some of the poorest people I've ever met who live in garbage, literally live in garbage, they have one of these. We are the most connected, the most informed generation the planet has ever seen, and we're the loneliest, most disconnected, most anxious culture humanity has ever seen. Amazing opportunities, but it requires us to have greater vision. Because what has worked 10 years ago will not work anymore because culture has rap rapidly changed. Now, here's the beauty of this type of mission is that when the church becomes mission-driven, nothing will help you grow more spiritually than that. <laughs> nothing, nothing that the church will do can help you become more like Jesus, <laughs> help you feel closer to God than being on Jesus' mission of seeking and saving the lost. Think about it. If your strategy for getting your grandkids here on Christmas Eve was to make them feel like crap <laughs> and guilt them, and that's not working anymore, more guilt's not going to fix it. You need to change your strategy. <laughs> so you're going to read your Bible more. You're going to pray more. You're going to go to your life group and get them praying for you more. You're going to read different books that you've never read before because you want your grandkids to know Jesus. <laughs> It changes how you do things. <laughs> when people are so polarized and you can't even bring up the name of Jesus because all the arguments and, and, the, nah, 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 and you're blind and you're a hypocrite and you're this, it changes how you relate to people. It will help you grow so spiritually. Hearing the words, well done, are directly connected to Jesus' mission of seeking and saving the lost. And the beauty of this is, guess what? You were the lost. I was the lost. The reason we take communion together is we break bread to remind ourselves as the church, yes, we're on mission to seek and save the lost, but it started with me. I had to be found. I had to be saved. There was nothing good about me. There was nothing holy about me. There was nothing righteous about me. I was a mutterer. <laughs> Complaining about everything and everybody with a smile. <laughs> but Jesus died for me, for you. When we take a moment to reflect on that, <laughs> that's what communion is supposed to do. To get our eyes off of ourselves <laughs> what I want, what I need, and all that. And just to take a moment and remember that even in my sin, God loved me so much that he would come to earth to seek and save me. So I'm going to call our ushers forward. We're going to take this bread and this cup together. If you're here today and you would say, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus, regardless of your church or denomination background, you're welcome to join in with us. Uh, if you are here today and you're, still, you're just not too sure what you believe and not too sure about this Jesus thing, I'm, just re I'm really grateful that you're here. But we would just ask that you let this go by. And when you take a piece of the bread, I'm just going to ask you to hold it, and then we're going to pray together, and then I'm going to conclude. So let's just take a moment to reflect and remember that Jesus came to seek and save me. So on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this bread represents my body broken for you because he is the God who came to seek and save the lost. Let's take this in remembrance of him. So in the same way, after supper, Jesus took a cup of wine. He said, this wine represents the new covenant in my blood, the new covenant that you can be made right with a holy God. Not by being religious, not by being rich, not by being perfect, not by keeping all the laws, but because Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And he found us. We take this in remembrance of him. So the big idea today is hearing well done from God is directly related to seek and save the lost. 
as we kick off a new sermon series and as we kick off a new ministry year together as a church family, my hope and my prayer is that this year in 2020, whether you make New Year's resolutions or not, (laughs) that you will make this one question the question that you will commit to answering this year. And the question is this, God, how am I using my life to seek and save the lost? (laughs) God, how am I using my life to seek and save the lost? You see, the beauty of the church, the beauty of the body of Christ is we all have a different role to play in it. It doesn't all look the same for all of us. So I can't get up here and say, here are the three ways you can seek and save the lost. (laughs) We're all on a journey to figure this out together. (laughs) But my hope and prayer is that we're going to answer this question. As culture has changed, as people have changed, the message of Jesus is timeless and has stayed the same but how God wants to work in and through us in this culture, in this day, in this age. We might have to tweak, might have to change, might have to readjust, but we'll have clear vision that we're doing this under this purpose, to use our lives to seek and save the lost. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you and thank you that we can worship you in this place and God, we thank you for your word and how when we do open it and unpack it, it really does become clear. It really does come alive. And so, Father, I praise you and thank you. Um, I thank you that Jesus came. I thank you that Jesus died. I thank you that Jesus rose from the dead. I thank you that Jesus is has returned to you. I'm thankful, God, that Jesus speaks on our behalf. God, I'm thankful that you sent your Holy Spirit to make us new, to empower and equip us into holy living so that we can continue the work that Jesus started to seek and save the lost. Father, in my life, for those times where I've put myself as the priority and my my glory and my comfort as the priority, forgive me for that, God. And God, help me to use my talents, my resources, my skills, Everything that you've given me, God, help me use it for your glory to reach people far from you. And for all of us as a church family, God, I pray over the course of this year, even starting today, you would reveal to us, God, your plan for our lives individually and as a church as we continue the mission of seeking and saving the lost. We're going to collect our offering now as a part of our worship. If you're a guest, please don't feel obligated to give unless God put that on your heart to do so. And as the worship team leads us in one last song, I just pray that you would rejoice and celebrate all that Jesus does in your life and continue to speak to him and ask him how he wants to use you in the year ahead. Let's worship. Amen. 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 Hearing well done from God is directly related to seek and save the lost. Hearing well done from God It's not about the number of toys you collect and how comfortable you are at the end of your days. (laughs) It's all about the mission of Jesus and how you allowed him to work in you and through you. And the beauty of following Jesus is when we do that, then he takes care of everything else. (laughs) When we seek first his kingdom, his purpose, his plans. If you're here today and you would like someone to pray for you, maybe you're just dealing with some stuff. There's a prayer room in the left side of the room here. People would love to pray for it, pray for you. If you're joining us online, you can send me a direct message. I'll be praying for you this week that way. If you're new with us, come to the cafe, say hi. I'm an introvert too, so you need to come and say hi to me because I get awkward. So come and say hi. would love to meet you in the cafe afterwards. And for everyone else, I pray you just have an amazing week seeking God, getting clearer vision on how God could use you to seek and save the lost people in your life. Have an amazing week. God bless.